Yeah, so Ingenuity um, is a is a secondary payload to um, the Mars Exploration Rover Perseverance, and uh, as far as I understand it, they had planned uh, for one to three flights to be um, the 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 full length of the science mission for the Ingenuity helicopter, um, and I believe it's done upwards of thirty uh, powered flights at this point. So. Um, very much exceeded its um, its intended uh, science mission uh, goals. Um, now, I do believe this is the first time that humanity has uh, achieved power flight on another planet. Um, and so that's different from falling and different from, um, you know, using rockets. Um, what's interesting is that the, the atmosphere on Mars is really thin. So um, it takes a little bit less energy, as I understand it, to... Um, achieve this powered flight. Um, and then based off of that, uh, the success that they've had on that platform, it's a planned mission to Titan. And I thought I had the name. Yes, it's called the Dragonfly. And so this one's going to be a quadcopter, kind of like uh, the drones mm -hmm. that we were talking about for the uh, fireworks displays. Okay. What's, do, they, do you have details on that mission in terms yes. of like what they're what they're planning to do with it or how long they're trying to use it? Yeah, so as I understand it, they, um, you know, they want to um, have powered flight uh, on Titan, one of Saturn's moons. Um, one of the big differences, like I mentioned, uh, from the Ingenuity um, uh, helicopter, let's say, is that this one has four different rotors. So Ingenuity only has one. And so it's going to have, you know, a little bit more uh, capacity to um, stay afloat uh, and hover. But it's really interesting because it's the first time that one of our science missions is going to be uh, entirely packaged onto something that flies. So usually, you know, we send our um, our science payloads and doing uh, science and experiments on these uh, mobile terrestrial platforms. But for the first time, it's going to be flight only uh, mission to uh, to this moon. So that's going to be quite interesting. And that dragonfly looks pretty interesting. It is a, it looks pretty big. How big is that? Do we know? So it, it um, apparently it's 450 kilograms. So that's, that is quite a bit. Yeah. It's like a thousand pounds. Yes. Give or take. Wow. It's a big drone. Sorry. I still have trouble thinking in metric. Yeah. So apparently some of the, um, you know, NASA is really focused on trying to find um, signs of life um, in our in our solar system and beyond. And so um, apparently Dragonfly is going to be looking for um, some of the precursors to life, um, chem chemistry precursors. Um, and it's going to be conducting a lot of that science from the air. So um, imaging, radar scanning, and then uh, some kind of long distance uh mass spectrography. Um, so a lot of observations from the air. That's pretty cool. Like you said, Matt, it, it's a massive vehicle. It's big. Okay, okay it looks like uh, the surface pressure is one and a half times um, as much as the Earth. Um, and so it is, you know, it is thicker um, if we can characterize it that way. Um, now, I think that's going to take, you know, a little bit more horsepower to get it done. But since the entire platform uh, is for the drone, I think they've been able to, um, you know, afford the, the payload and batteries. Um, it'd be interesting to see what type of um, power sources they're going to use for this. But, you know, I think I think the point uh, of highlighting this um, this program is that, you know, we use these advanced robotics to um, explore uh, hazardous uh destinations in space that would just be a lot more complex to um, get humans to. And so, you know, even if we had, um, you know, this type of uh, airborne science platform on Mars, you'd be able to cover a lot more distance than if you had uh, human explorers on there. So, um, you know, the trend that we've seen so far is that NASA sends these robotic assistants um, as a precursor to then uh, evaluating manned missions. And so, you know, if you cover more ground um, with these types of uh, tools, then you can really identify the very best place for people to land in upcoming missions. And so 
um, you know, exploration would be a lot more difficult without, without these types of uh, robotic programs. I would venture to guess once we're in a different environments within the galaxy, we'll be using similar technologies long-term as well. Even once we do have established human presence there um, just to conduct like, you know, everyday missions that, that I'm sure are going to be necessary. You know, um, I, I know we've talked about it in a previous episode, I think on this podcast, it may have been in, on one of the spaces, but um, Miguel, you mentioned there's, you know, a tangible benefit to having manned missions specifically to like Mars or to the moon. Um, but within those manned missions, maybe not early on, but long term, um, there's going to be an ongoing need for um, <clears throat> the use of robotics and things like that to to further uh, basically our our grasp or our abilities yeah. in those, in those places. Well, and the reality is, is as we get further into space with our mission profiles and we're exploring these, uh, further planets and moons, asteroids, the delay time in human operations or data transfer between, uh, earth and where these, vehicles are operating makes it nearly for all practical reasons, nearly impossible to do many of the operations and maneuvers without an autonomous robotic system, uh, making the decisions and facilitating the maneuvers and operations for the mission profile. So not only is it helpful to have robots facilitate operations in places that humans can't go, it's a necessity to have autonomous systems in place because uh, we just can't control things because of the data delay. So it's interesting to see some of the evolution in autonomous vehicles and autonomous robots and arms and what they're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a big factor in why it's so important for robotic systems and AI systems to be developed uh, simultaneously for space exploration and, and mining operations. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and so just to clarify, it turns out that the gravity on Titan is about 14% that of Earth's. And so the thicker atmosphere, but the lower gravity actually makes it um, ideal for um, propelled mm. flight. Very nice. Interesting. Yeah. It's like flying through custard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, and so, yeah, there's, there's, um, you know, there's three different, uh, uh categories of, um, robots that we use in space. So, um, the first one, like the, uh, Dragonfly mission to Titan is, uh, what they call the Explorer uh, robots. Um, there's another kind called assistant robots, which, um, work in conjunction with, um, astronauts, um, to perform some of the critical functions, um, that you need to do uh, when you're in space. And so this could be repair, um, sustainment, um, and exploration. And then lastly, we have uh, a category called automated systems where um, these systems uh, co operate completely independently um, and they uh, also form an important part of our, of our exploration uh, goals. And so a really good example of this is the, um, the Mars uh, sky crane, which um, is the the uh, the vehicle that uh, that delivered the Perseverance rover onto the Mars uh, surface. Um, so, for those of you that don't know, um, this was essentially um, a a uh, a crane that uh, had the Perseverance rover um, tucked underneath. Um, and as uh, the the payload you know entered the Martian atmosphere, its goal was to fire uh, its booster rockets, uh, slow down uh, its descent and then hoist down the Perseverance rover onto the Martian surface. Uh, and so after that was complete, again, all this while firing its, um, its booster, uh, s small booster rockets, uh, after it delivered Perseverance rover, it then flew off autonomously um, and crash landed uh, uh, at a safe distance. And so that type of system that just is meant to operate completely independently uh, of any human input um, is also a crucial element 
uh, in our use of robotics for, for space exploration. Yeah, not to mention when you're talking about like fine motor movements, um, AI is going to react infinitely faster than any human could ever imagine to, even if there was no delay issue. Um, yes. So yes, when you're yes, talking for about, sure. Yeah, when you're talking about equipment that's worth like million, you know, millions and millions of dollars, it only makes sense. So another uh, example of an exploration robot um, is the Nova Sea lander from Intuitive Machines that's going to be landing um, on the moon. Um, this uh, robot carries a payload called the Polar Resources Ice Mining Experiment from NASA, aka the Prime One uh, instrument. And the goal of this uh, Explore robot is to um, drill beneath the surface um, to corroborate that um, that they're going to be able to find ice um, when the human explorers uh, get onto the moon. Um, and so again, another, you know, really critical piece of robotics where, um, you know, we can select the sites for human landing and exploration based on having already discovered uh, critical resources there in abundance. Um, so again, just another way that, uh, you know, these, these explorer robots are absolutely critical in paving the way for humans to um, explore beyond Earth. Such a large, wide variety of different types of robots that companies are coming up with right now to explore the surface from drone systems to rovers that are rolling to systems that are crawling around like little spiders. There's one called, I think it's called the puffer or spike, spiky. And it's just, uh, it just bounces. It's like a cube and it just bounces and it lands in any direction and it just bounces to the next. And that one's actually being developed for um, asteroid uh, material discovery. So they plan to land several of those on different small bodies and um, have them roll around in very low gravity environments. So I, I just think there's, it's so interesting in all of the different types of methods and different technologies that are being explored for the different terrains. I mean, you think of all the terrains here on Earth, um, which there are many, but we're having to rediscover how to do basic mobility um, in, in zero gravity environments, low gravity environments, environments that are completely new to us. So it's just a very interesting space right now. Yeah, I seem to recall seeing something about how um, the the inspiration for that bouncing robot was watching some of the early footage of the Apollo astronauts bouncing on the moon. So what they realized was that, um, you, you know, having this type of bouncing uh, kinematic, uh, especially in low gravity environments, was, was a great way to get around. Um, and so, you know, obviously super, super interesting stuff, really good approach. Yeah, so if you've ever watched, if you if you haven't ever watched it, go check it out. Like some of the NASA bloopers, they're pretty funny. It's it's great stage acting here yeah. in, in Burbank. <laughs> in fact, in fact, I remember I remember hearing that um, they they didn't actually know what the surface of the moon was going to be like. So you know they had they had some ideas, but when uh, you know they first stepped onto the surface of the moon. There was there was a possibility that they weren't going to be able to get a good foothold, um, and so obviously that that included um, you know the landing vehicle. They they weren't sure if they were going to sink into the the dirt or not. It's so terrifying to like imagine. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. To be in that position and not know. <laughs> yep, and and obviously now we can say oh you know they they were willing to take those risks because they could say they were going to be the first, but. You, you know, it, it, it didn't need to be that way. I mean, it's it's a the moon landing and the names, uh, you know, of the astronauts are obviously really famous now, but they didn't have that to hold on to, you know, to say, you know, I'm going to be famous for, you know, forever um, if I if I die doing this. And so, um, you know, obviously really, really brave uh, explorers who are willing to, you know, risk everything um, in the name of, of exploration and science. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and now if you think about like, uh, 
humans landing on Mars. We know so much more about Mars and we will know even more by the time we land humans on the surface of Mars than we did about the moon's surface or what was on the moon. And so those early explorers, those early astronauts, they were pioneers with, you know, with one eye uh, blindfolded exploring things that we really didn't know much about. There's a, and, and on Mars exploration, there's a, uh, early stage development of uh, uh, like a swarm of small, tiny uh, scanning, scanning robots, robots that they, they plan on plan. releasing on to the Martian surface that will map all of the terrain of Mars in basically, you know, as, as much detail, yeah, height, height, terrain. Mm -hmm variable types and all that stuff. And there'll just be hundreds of them and they'll just go out and map the entire terrain potentially before we even land folks on the surface. And so uh, still going to Mars is a huge feat, uh, but those early astronauts landing on the moon, that's a different level. Well, uh, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to touch on that for a second because I've heard some people say that um, a lot of the the um, the merit of space exploration is no longer around because we have, you know, much more information and, and we've gotten to practice some things. And so their argument was, you know, the person, for example, that climbed Mount Everest first was a lot braver um, than the person that climbed Mount Everest, you know, the 10,000th time. And while I think that's um, true to some extent, you know, you're still sort of risking life and limb, um, you know, for so that so that everybody can benefit um, from from your work. And so, uh, you know, I think um, I'm glad that the risk, you know, to astronauts is a lot lower these days. I don't think, um, you know, the courage and the the merit, um, you know, of their work is is any less, though. I think as we push the boundaries, the distance of known space, there's new level, additional levels that, that open up of merit. Um, because, yeah, I mean, going to the moon and, that, and all of the robotic systems that we have in place now, um, it's not what it was, what it first was, or going to Mars. Put, but going to Mars pushes that boundary of distance and unexplored human uh, it, it, you know, exploration. But I mean, speaking of Everest, like the line going up Everest these days is like, it, it's like a, a ride at Disneyland. The number yeah. of people that are on their way up to the summit of Everest. It's, yeah, it's a little with a ridiculous. Crew, with a crew of people carrying their bags for them and cooking three meals a day, setting and, up the tents. I imagine <laughs> that the line to Mars will eventually have a queue in a similar fashion and we'll be sending people like they're jumping on a plane out of LAX. Does that make them, what does that make them at that point? Are they explorers? Are they ask, are they just, they travelers well, at that point? That's the thing. I, I, I don't think like, like to what you were saying, Miguel, I don't think that new space exploration or space advancement uh, people within that are any less courageous, but, um, you know, comparing it to, I, I see what you were saying too, Matt, like comparing it to like Lewis and Clark, for example, you know, it'd be like the equivalent of them flying a drone to the Pacific ocean and like drawing out the map to through the mountains to get there. Right. Uh, before they went, actually went. Um, so I get that. Like maybe it's, it's, maybe the the people who stepped foot on the moon were like the last romanticized explorers or the last of that you know truly like wild explorer type <laughs> uh until I, we get someone like the uss enterprise a couple hundred years from now yeah right? i think i think there will see you know like like you guys were saying those those new boundaries for you know the real hardcore explor exploration will keep will keep appearing so mm -hmm. um but you know, one way to one way to make that less risky is with the help of assistant robots, which is the next category that we wanted to um, talk a little bit about. 
And so um, assistant robots are a category of um, robotic uh, instruments that essentially um, help astronauts perform some of the functions um, that they have to do on their daily basis. And so I wanted to highlight a product that's called Astrobee. Now, Astrobee is a platform um, of cube-shaped robots um, that operate inside the International Space Station. And this is um, a technology platform that's actually been uh, in development and has, has been uh, you know, undergoing improvements for about a decade, as I understand it. And so the, um, the Astrobee robots, um, there's three of them, and um, they, they fly around the interior of the International Space Station with um, powered fan motors. Um, and they have the ability to um, go and dock um, at their docking station and recharge their battery um, when they're not being used. So this is kind of like a, a 3D Roomba in space, okay? Um, and, I was just going to say that. It's a yeah. space Roomba. <laughs> you know, they can be operated uh, uh, either by the astronauts or um, from mission control um, down on Earth. Um, and they can help. Uh, they have cameras on board. Um, and they have different uh, different instruments, but they can they also have uh, a robotic arm. Um, so you can have, for example, the astronauts asking for a tool um, uh, while they're you know in the process of fixing something, and the astro B will go and navigate to the tool uh, and bring it back to them um, again, w either with or without um, assistance. Um, you also have uh, situations where you need to go um, make an observation. Uh, at a particular module inside the International Space Station, and, and you can just send um, the the astrobees to monitor um, certain conditions, even while the astronauts are sleeping. And so, um, you know, it's a great example of these um, assistant robots uh, category that are also, you know, re really critical for space exploration. Okay, my favorite in this category is the Robonaut, and it is a human-like robot that has actually was was actually sent up into the ISS by NASA um, over 10 years ago. And uh, it's had many functionality and tools. It, it had some major electronic problems a couple years back and they brought it back down to earth to fix it up and develop the Ast RoboNot 2. Um, but there's also one that's developed from the Robonaut technology and from, from that style called R5. And it is, it's a very serious uh, humanoid looking Robonaut for doing all sorts of uh, space walk activities inside and outside of the ISS and other space. I imagine they'll be sending this at some point up to the Lunar Gateway um, and to other locations to do things that uh, they don't want to send astronauts out to do. Uh, and it can climb the outside of, you know, around the outside of the, the space station. And uh, there's a couple of variations uh, of these humanoid-like robots that NASA and partners are developing. But uh, it's kind of interesting they went the direction of very human-like design, um, and I'm I'm curious. You know, I don't I don't know this. Like, what what are the and Miguel, maybe you do. What are the reasons for going humanoid design on some of these robots? Is it to fit the form factor of some of the crafts that we're developing, or I just I, I often think that there's a more practical design for purpose-driven robots. Yeah, but I mean, th that's actually, you know, one of the directions I wanted to go um, anyways, which is humanoid robots for both um, exploration and assistance. And, you know, the the there's a couple of really compelling reasons to make your robots um, humanoids. First of all, um, you know, a lot of the interfaces for the systems and vehicles um, are built with human interface in mind. Right. So if you have a robot that um, has similar form factor with digits um, um, and legs, then you can adapt a lot of your um, you know, instruments and, and scientific um, equipment to to that form factor. Um, but, you know, I think the human form factor also lends itself really well to um, 
getting around and also um, you know, solving a particular type of problem. And so, you know, let's say that you're on the surface of the moon and, and your, um, your robotic assistant is a, is a humanoid form. Um, it may be able to carry uh, and move things across terrain uh, in a much more um, efficient way, let's say, than, than a, a rover that, um, you know, has limited mobility or can't uh, get over rocks or can't, uh, you know, make sharp turns. And so, um, you know, the human form, again, is really good at um, doing non-standard tasks. Um, and so, you know, I think we've seen sort of a Tesla company um, trying to lead the way with their their humanoid robot assistants um, that they're going to be putting out in the next few years. And so I think it's a really there's there's a lot of really compelling reasons to make um, a robotic assistance in space sort of have this humanoid uh, form factor. Yeah. That would you sense. buy a Tesla robot? Uh, I think I would. <laughs> Depends would, on what it does. I would. I yeah, would that's especially... my question. That's my big question. What does it do? Yeah, I would especially buy a Tesla robot if I was going to space. How about that? I would I would buy that type mm -hmm. of robot over, you know. Yeah, yes. so, uh, you, you know, honestly speaking, I think, you know, robotic assistance in space will continue to trend towards that humanoid form factor. I think you're going to have, you know, dedicated vehicles like, um, you know, the Perseverance rover and, and the lunar mobility vehicle that they're building. Um, but again, you, you would be able to get, um, a lot more out of a humanoid robot assistant, um, that has, uh, you know, multiple purposes and, and multiple functions, the ability to, uh, you know, have similar dexterity to, to humans than a dedicated, um, you know, robotic platform for this specific task or that specific task. And so, um, you know, again, I think uh, we're going to eventually trend in that direction. Um, and those those types of uh, robotic assistants will be able to sort of help us explore, um, continue exploration. Do we consider put, TARS a humanoid robot? That's a good question. That is a good question. I I think it has, he, TARS had humanoid features, right? At in arms, a way. Legs, Although, kind of. Kind of. Yeah, kind of. It had appendages, up, I guess. He he ended up carrying uh, one mm -hmm. of the astronauts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although I think I think that form was, you know, sort of kind of meant to be poetic. I think practically speaking, if you have a robot like that try to carry a person, I think it, you know, would be tough. Yeah, I was was curious about the design choice for the TARS robot like yeah it was would, it was really beautiful but I was like I think it was more of an homage to yeah uh, films of the past than it was totally. to the reality of the future totally which is super interesting you know why why would they why would they go on a limb like that you know mm -hmm. I mean super interesting yeah there's you know a lot of my favorite films and tv shows are are very steeped in homages. Um, there's one that I watched growing up a ton called Psych. It was on USA Network. Like they do tons of homages, um, which I always that. like really appreciated. But I want to send um, I want to okay. send a spaceship with a dozen yeah. robots um, to mm -hmm. you know new yeah. planets or or asteroids, etc. To set up camps right and we know that they'll be able to set everything up um the way you'd want astronauts to do it because they have you know those same that same mobility and, and dexterity mm -hmm. um and then afterwards they just you know power down or you keep a couple of them to help you you know perform actions but um you know i think that would be that'd be a compelling reason to have sort of those humanoid platforms is Totally. And I mean, think about it from, from like a, a, an agricultural perspective in those areas. Like if we get into farming at some point, farmhands become robotics, you know, completely. Everything yeah. becomes automated and, and autonomous so that the people there can maximize their time um, to push the mission, whatever mission they're on forward, as opposed to, um, you know, 
focusing on survival elements. Yeah. But, but I mean, you bring up a really good point, which is, you know, imagine you're trying to do some farming. You can have a dedicated farming robot, which can get it done. Right. Or you can have a humanoid <clears throat> robot, which can plant some stuff and water some mm -hmm. plants. But once it's done, it can go move some equipment around. Mm -hmm. You can go type things in a keyboard or command to, you know, shut down power or something. It can go do some other activities. And so, again, that a humanoid um, form factor just lends itself to do so many different things. It's more multifaceted, and I think it serves a purpose of diversity when it's applicable. I think that uh, very specific form factor and use case designed robots for long-term industrialization or repetitive tasks that are to be done at an indefinite amount of period of time. Those, those cer certainly are important and can mm -hmm, be sure. much more productive and efficient. But I think ultimately robots, robotic systems, uh, autonomous and uh, semi-autonomous systems they're going to pave the way for exploration and the foundation of colonization of any future outpost and civilization of space. Um, I don't, uh, from my opinion, I don't see us ever breaking ground like we did uh, in the Apollo era on any planet or uh, celestial body before robotic systems pave the way for us to inhabit and successfully, you know, uh, stay and, and facilitate life on those planets. So I think they're super important and, and ultimately, um, you know, they're the precursor to any, any habitable and sustainable environment that humans are going to be traveling to in the future. Now, Miguel, where do robots like the Canada arm, it's robotics, it's not AI, but things like the Canada arm or Dext, um, spider knot, uh, stuff like that. How, where do those fit in the category of robotics? Yes. Great question. So Canada arm and Canada arm two are, um, firmly in the assistant uh, robotics category. And so um, the Canada Arm is a piece of equipment that lives outside the International Space Station. Um, and I believe the last time that I heard it had um, 10 individual joints. Um, and so it's very large. And this, uh, this Canada Arm, or Canada Arm 2, um, has the ability to capture um, space modules that are coming in um, to dock with the International Space Station. So I believe um, the, the Dragon uh, cargo module uh, has been captured by the Canada Arm um, previously, at least on one occasion. And so they use this for, again, capturing um, incoming uh, vehicles that want to dock uh, with the International Space Station when needed. Um, they use it for transporting the astronauts to particular positions um, where they may need to be uh, doing a repair. Um, and they also use it to reposition um, modules of the International Space Station um, from one docking port to another. And so, you know, in terms of um, robotics that have, uh, you know, achievements under their belt, the Canada Arm 2 is really one of the highlights of um, robotics and, and uh, using robotics for exploration in space. Um, and so that's, you know, a really good example of uh, assistant uh, robotics. The Canada Arm 2 is almost 18 meters in length. Its reach is almost 18 meters. That's a long, that's a very big arm. And I know the Canada Arm 3 that's being developed for the Gateway, I actually believe is much smaller. It's only about half, uh, I think about seven and a half meters. Obviously, I think it probably has more mobility. Maybe doesn't need the length, but these are big arms. These are big robotic assistants. And there, there's a lot of robotic arms in development. I know as part of 
uh, what X Labs is doing. You know, we're we're going to be developing systems, uh, robotic systems for our vehicles, and um, we've, you know, we're learning and understanding all of the players in this space that are developing robotic arms for different uh, use cases and purposes. And you know, there's over, I think, uh, 27 different companies or different projects in place right now that NASA is working and fund working on and funding with contracts for robotic arm systems that serve various different purposes from you know Canada arm 3 to uh, you know motive arms and links that are for all of these different ro robotic landers Mars landers um, and various different uh, uh, object acquisition or object in engagement vehicles. And so this is a very hot area right now of development is the robotic arms and uh, motion control. So I know, Miguel, you had one more thing you wanted to talk about before we signed off today. But um, I also wanted to ask about the Air Force's uh, X-37B space drone. Um, so the X-37B is a um, supposed to be uh, an autonomous um, type of replacement for the space shuttle. So when the space shuttle was around, um, the Air Force had the ability to deliver payloads um, and sort of make observations out in space. And so... Um, I think around the time that the uh, space shuttle was scheduled to be decommissioned, um, the Air Force uh, started development on the X-37B. And the X-37B started out as a, um, a research vehicle, so that the X-series platform, it's just, um, you know, different, different research and, and far-fetched ideas that they, that they build. Um, but currently, the X-37B uh, vehicle um, holds the record for um, longest time spent in orbit, um, I believe, out of you know any reusable vehicles. So that includes um, uh, the space shuttle um, and anything else that's gone up there that's not a satellite. Um, and I believe, if I remember correctly, that um, you know when it launches, it can spend up to 300 days um, in low Earth orbit, uh, performing science uh, and observation. Uh, for the Air Force, um, I believe uh, it's been um, it's been observed uh, from uh, Earth uh, through telescopes, um, and it sort of has uh, it's it's shaped like a mini space shuttle um, that has a a payload door that can open and uh, deliver payload to space or uh, bring payloads back. And so, you know, again, it looks, a, it looks very much like the space shuttle. Like if you take yeah, it does. Some it really does. It. It's like it's, and, it is just like a mini space shuttle. Just a quick, a quick uh, correction on that that time frame. It's actually mm -hmm. over five hundred days that it can yes be in orbit. I knew. I mean, I, yeah. I knew it was something you know really awesome like that. And so yeah, uh, it's in, ter crazy. in terms of automated platforms, um, robotic platforms, you know, that's a that's a really uh, exceedingly great example of um, you know what we can do with robotics. Um, out in space. Now, obviously, the X-37B is a classified program, uh, and the, the nature of the missions um, that they run uh, are classified, and so we don't know very much about what it can do. Um, but obviously, in terms of its uh, autonomy and ability to um, spend time in orbit um, without needing to be serviced is, uh, is obviously, uh, you know, a great, uh, a great benchmark. And so it's, it's kind of like an RC plane that can go into space. So then the, um, the last example that I wanted to give um, is going into the um, automated systems um, type of robotics. So um, Venus is, uh, you know, one of the planets in our solar system, and it's notoriously difficult to um, explore from up close because um, of its atmosphere. Um, and so the, the pressure on Venus is uh, exceedingly, exceedingly high. Um, I believe it's supposed to be... Um, you know, like, like being something like being like thousands of feet um, beneath the surface, beneath the ocean. Um, and then it's also uh, very, very hot. So it's uh, about 900 degrees Fahrenheit um, on the surface. And so um, in 1975, 
the Soviet Union sent a probe to Venus um, to go and, you know, do some exploration and see, um, you know, what kind of data they could get. Um, and so they were able to um, launch the Venera probe. Um, I believe it was Venera 9 uh, uh, probe in particular um, that made it all the way out to Venus um, and landed. And because, you know, it's very far away, a lot of the, the mission uh, and data needed to be programmed to be done um, autonomously. And so it was able to survive for, I believe, um, something like eight minutes. Um, and then it was able to take, um, the, you know, the only picture that we've ever taken, humanity's ever taken from the surface of Venus. Um, and so, you know, we have this picture, it's out there on the internet. If you search a Venera picture of, of Venus, um, and so it's just amazing to think that we, you know, we're able to send, um, you know, these automated s robotics um, out into the harshest, some of the harshest environments in our solar system um, and get them to, you know, do some of these actions, perform some of the science um, and get actual readings from the surface of Venus um, completely autonomously. Yeah. So, again, you know, the, the use of robotics, um, you know, for space exploration you know, it's absolutely critical. And I think, um, you know, as we continue to go deeper and deeper um, into the solar system, you know, I think our robot robotic companions will only get um, better equipped uh, and smarter. And so, you know, I think, um, I think that's, you know, one reason for companies such as Exploration Labs to continue to develop, you know, robotic solutions for, for deep space applications. Um, but again, it's also really encouraging that companies that are Earth-based mostly, like Tesla, um, you know, are, are also interested in developing, and Boston Dynamics are also um, interested in developing sort of humanoid uh, platforms that can eventually help us um, both with applications here on Earth and, and also in deep space. World record for deepest dive on scuba is 332 meters. Yeah. And, and what's, so what's interesting is it's almost harder to do it with a scuba tank because if you're holding your breath, you can dive down and come back up. But if you're diving with a tank, you have to come up in stages as you're breathing. Um, otherwise, your lungs will explode. Apparently, um, how far down can you get one breath? The the world record for a free dive is uh, insane, but 213 meters, so wow. 702 feet. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, the yeah, person insane. that holds the record for the deepest dive is Chief Navy diver Daniel Jackson in what's called an atmospheric diving system. Um, and it's uh, it looks like a suit from, uh, you know, from a, from a 1960s sci-fi movie. Um, in fact, they don't <laughs> even call it, they don't even call it a suit. They call it an, an articulated submersible. Yeah. It's like a, a submarine that's in the shape of a person. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's terrifying. It is totally a submarine in the shape of a person. Like if you look at the the second you see the, picture on the you see on the, the little the little clips little in claws. his hands. Yeah. yeah, that's so cool. Don't they just send a submarine down at that point hmm. to say yeah. you did it? Yeah, to say you did it. I think you can also you, you know your mobility is a little bit different. You can also yeah. um, you know move things around, and if you're trying to sabotage some underwater lines, you know, pipelines or, you know, internet cables or anything, uh, a person, you know, may be able to use different tools and be a little bit more precise than, than something that's, um, I, I don't know. Do you, do you see them getting lowered? Do you see those photos of them getting lowered into the water? <laughs> yeah. They, they just, they look completely incapable of movement of any movement whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like a little kid with 15 coats on in the winter. Yeah. It's like, uh, <laughs> what's his name from a Christmas story? Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. Nice. I have one more question for you guys regarding humanoid forms. Is that truly the most efficient form? Or is that only the form that we're most comfortable with? Because, like, we're programmed to think 
had to solve problems within the context of that form. You know? I, I think I think it's an easy answer. <laughs> our world, especially our modern industrialized civilization, has been developed around our form factor. Mm-hmm. So uh, when you look at our planet and the universe and other planets and, and asteroids and all of these other things that factor into our existence in this universe – to say that the human form factor is the most efficient and practical one is probably not extremely accurate. Uh, you, you would, if you took an analysis of every uh, surface and object and thing in this universe and tried to perform or develop the, the best form factor for it, I don't think you're going to get a humanoid shape or object or form factor that that's Agreed. a scientific wild ass guess right there no well, i think you're my, i think you're fairly accurate yeah my, my mind immediately went to goro from mortal Kombat. he just has four <laughs> arms <laughs> so that's clearly the most optimized uh just solution add more arms yeah, that's that's what is really what it really comes down to. No, but I, but I think you know I think Matt, you're on point, which is that the the humanoid form factor for for robotics in space would would have would be the most common with with the human explorers, right? And mm-hmm. again, one thing that we've we've proven we're really good at is to be able to solve um, sort of novel problems um, and, and things that don't um, re- require a lot of repetition. Um, and so, yeah, obviously, you know, in the factories, you have dedicated robots that performing certain functions. But when you want something that can do as many things as possible, which you will never, you, you know, you never know every situation you're going to run into when you do exploration, then that humanoid form factor starts to look really, you know, really interesting, right? In terms of mobility, in terms of dexterity, in terms of uh, carrying capacity, um, and th- these types of things. This is another wild, wild ass science theory with no basis in fact or knowledge, uh, other than my own opinion. But I feel like humans aren't optimal in any environment. We uh, can manage in any environment. We just happen to have a big brain and a couple of thumbs that uh, can grip onto things really well. Um, you know, it's all but about to your, thumbs. Good yeah, enough. Yeah. To your point too, like, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, a human sized door, uh, you know, an eight legged arachnid robot might be more efficient for a specific job, but if it can't get through the door, what good is it? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, and so what that means is you, you don't have to develop, you know, multiple platforms, one for your robot and one for your person. Right. So, so mm-hmm. the commonality is another um, benefit. I would really venture to guess, again, without any sort of professional knowledge or insight, <laughs> I would venture to guess there's a huge psychological factor, too, in terms of like being comfortable about around robots, you know, Um yeah, 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 actually, you know, that's a great point. So um, the psychology of deep space is, is something that, um, you know, is really important. Um, they talk about, um, you know, six-month deep space missions to Mars, right? And so um, some of the things that they have been doing with the Astrobee that we talked about is they have a screen that they can, you know, display information on. A lot of times they can turn that uh, onto a human humanoid face, and when the robot, you know, is talking back some information, it, it looks like a person that's talking back to you. So, you know, I, I absolutely agree that, that um, you know, the psychology of um, sort of fighting off the loneliness with um, mm-hmm. sort of a, an assistant that has humanoid shape, um, you know, could be a really important factor in deciding, um, you know, the, the form factor for your, your robotics platform. Um, and again, this is this is stuff that they've already been, working on that they already know uh, there there's a need for it, right? Mm-hmm. That, the psychological component. So absolutely, 100%. So your, space, your intuition was correct. <laughs> space Castaway starring Wilson. Yeah. Um, well, and then the other, the other side of that too is like from a communication perspective, 
you know, so much of our communication as a species is nonverbal. And if you could replicate that long term via AI, uh, just think how much more efficient you could potentially be, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know I, if I, you start to blur the lines, right, between artificial intelligence and humanity at a certain point. And I know there's tons of movies out there that explore that that line. But, um, yeah, it's an intriguing concept to to think about. Definitely starting to blur the line already. In Japan, there's about 3,500 people a year that get married to robots. Huh. So there's a there's a metric of uh, progress, I guess. Hey, uh, has anybody gotten married in space? I I doubt it. I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of. First marriage in space. <laughs> First wedding in space, huh? No, no, don't Google it. We'll 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 keep the suspense on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt there has been, but soon to be, I'm sure, with all of this uh space tourism. Maybe it'll be a marriage to a robot. Good thing. Hey. Never if you doubt. haven't watched the movie Her, I'd advise not watching it. But it's uh, eventually <laughs> that's going to be the situation on one lonely person's trip to some <laughs> faraway distant space outpost. 